is currently the director of the School for Mathematical and Natural Sciences, Arizona State University. Thanks, Jose. Um, and um, good, uh, good morning if you're over here on the West Coast and good afternoon if you're in another time zone. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Jose, Lydia, Sias for um, putting on this workshop as well as uh, the first set of speakers because I learned so much um, listening to the generation ahead of me. Um, we were asked sort of three questions, I think, and I'll, I'll try to touch base a little bit on each of those in the time that I have. Um, and perhaps even address some of the questions that I saw in the, in the chat, which were some great questions there um, that had more to do with sort of actionable responses uh, to structural racism um, and its different forms if you're at the student level, the faculty level, and perhaps even at the administrator um, level. Um, um, so first question was my, what is your path uh, to leadership, including barriers and people and circumstances that were beneficial? So I'll start off talking a little bit how I came to where I am. I didn't actually expect, you know, going to college for me was a 50-50 or a 60-40, 70-30, um, where the lower percentage was going to college. Um, and mostly because of my experience in the public school system um, was, was largely negative. Um, the last um, teachers, teachers that I had who I actually had a good relationship with uh, was my first grade teacher who I actually visited um, a couple of years ago. Um, after about first grade, um, it was largely combative. Um, and, and so my parents, um, as most parents uh, in my generation, uh, my generation of folks um, demanded excellence. So was, I couldn't slack off, but I certainly couldn't. <laughs> I certainly had a choice by the time I was done. And so I was uh, sort of backed into college. Um, and I made a decision at the very last minute, my senior year of high school, um, largely because I happened to visit Atlanta and I went down to the Atlanta University uh, Center complex and saw people who looked like me having fun in college. And I didn't think that was actually possible. Um, and so I uh, applied, came back home, tried to apply as quickly as I could and um, was accepted into Morehouse College, um, went to Morehouse College and got a very strong culture shock in that it looked like everyone there was, was rich. I rode the bus to college from Washington State. I finished my um, high school in Eastern Washington, Spokane, Washington, um, which is very isolating. Uh, and so I was looking to get out and just be someplace where I did not feel um, put upon daily. And so uh, took the bus, got down to uh, Atlanta on the Greyhound, um, picked up my suitcase of my belongings and went over to the MARTA station and then took the train uh, to the nearest train station uh, to campus. And then I walked uh, the other three quarters of a mile to campus in August in Atlanta, which is, is not pretty. Um, and I got to the campus and the parking lot was filled with BMWs and Mercedes Benz and all these cars and you know families dropping off their kids. And I said, you know, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. Um, and so in about two weeks, um, I was trying to keep up with everybody else and it ran out of my tuition money basically. Um, and the person who kept me in school was Henry McBay, who stopped me as I was running through a building uh, to get off campus to go find a part-time job to try to generate enough money to convince the registrar that I could make a partial payment. And uh, he stopped me and gave me 
um, directed me to a research job in chemistry with the condition that I major in chemistry. Um, and when I accepted that, because he said he would buy my books, buy my computer, buy my act, um, calculator, take care of, you know, you know, give me a break financially until I could get the money to pay um, and get me a job. Um, he said, well, if you major in chemistry, you got to major in math. I said, okay, I'll major in, in math. I like math better than chemistry, actually. Um, and that was how I stayed in school. Um, my first research experience with, was, was with John Hall Jr., um, who had a joint appointment at Georgia Tech. And by the time I, I loved doing the research in the lab, uh, that's what kept me motivated, kept me studying and kept me in uh, school. I was able to get other scholarships and, and make my way through and manage my finances a little bit better after that first two weeks. Um, and I looked at what those professors were doing um, and a couple of other professors actually from the same uh, classes in chemistry would come out. Jim King uh, came out from Caltech, uh, Bill Lester came out from Berkeley and looking at those first uh, role models um, sort of told me that there's something that I could do besides a job. Uh, some, you know, besides go work for somebody, I could actually follow my own curiosity and pursuits. I could study this thing that I really liked, which was uh, chemistry and atmospheric sciences, and, um, and stay on that path and, and not have to break and do something different. It allowed, you know, required me to continue in school, but, you know, that's what uh, I was prepared to do at that time. And so, I entered Georgia Tech, um, leaving Morehouse, went to Georgia Tech. Uh, I was the first African-American to uh, get their PhD from that program. And it, um, the numbers in geosciences, um, there was one other black PhD who graduated in the same year that I graduated. Um, and this is before social media and all of these things. You find out through NSF, oh, there's one other black guy. and track him down, it turned out to be Greg Jenkins, and we still are uh, colleagues and friends to this day. Um, but the isolation in graduate school, I switched to barriers. Um, and, and thinking about uh, some of the things uh, that I think um, Rita and Willie talked about, or uh, John about, you have to just persevere. One of the skills or aspects of your personality that you must have almost is, is a combative persistence that despite the things that are put in your path, you're dogged. I'm not sure if that should be a requirement um, in the way that it is uh, for minoritized um, identities, but it, it was for me. And I think it was for most of the folks that I know who came in through my in my generation of folks. I do think geosciences is marginally beyond what uh, it sounds like engineering was in the 1970s, if you look at the academy. Um, there are very few um, professors in the academy with degrees in atmospheric sciences who are black. Um, um, I think the numbers um, are in the low uh, think of BIPOC, I think the numbers are maybe in the five to 6% range um, from what we were able to garner from a recent study. It's mostly male. Uh, it's less, 1% or less um, female. Um, and I think that's largely due uh, to some of the things uh, that have been talked about before, but also um, greater choices. Um, once you get there, that you don't have to work in a toxic environment to really realize or, uh, or fulfill what you want to do. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of attrition from the pools of folks who would be qualified and ultimately be successful in the academy. Um, but uh, I think they've just got more choices uh, and, and psychologically and physically better choices uh, than to compromise your your mental state or your health 
uh, to try to survive in, in, in the, the academy as it stands right now. Um, but the path of leadership, uh, as I went on, I, I went from Georgia Tech to Lawrence Livermore, from Lawrence Livermore to uh, University of California, uh, and then I returned um, to Howard University. And HBCUs at that time, and even when I first came as an undergrad, I think they're unique in being able to provide you with leadership opportunities as soon as you decide that you want to undertake leadership opportunities. And so when I came to Howard, I came in as deputy director of a NASA center, which um, there's pluses and minuses doing that as a pre-tenure faculty. But what it allowed me to do was see how larger research uh, organizations are constructed, how they run, how the budgets work, uh, how to develop uh, larger center proposals at a very early stage. Um, and that led to a number of other opportunities um, through the NSF Career Award. Uh, NSF was uh, very major in supporting me as a, as a junior faculty. Um, but also building relationships in Washington, D.C. with the other federal agencies. Um, and inspired by some of those um, relationships and actually African-Americans in the, uh, largely in the federal agencies at NASA, at NOAA, at Department of Energy, who were in related disciplines uh, to support some of my ideas to build larger efforts. And also at the same time, try to recruit more African-Americans to Howard. And so, you know, one of the first sort of really big steps, I think, was developing a new atmospheric sciences graduate program at Howard University. And um, I think there was a lot of naivete there, but um, again, HBCUs were a place where you, by and large at that time, people weren't gonna tell you, no, that's a crazy idea. You as an individual can't do that. And so, um, actually Greg Jenkins was on faculty, uh, Sonia Smith, who's still there, Everett Joseph, who's now at NCAR, uh, Belida Mose at UMBC. There's a cluster, a critical mass of black faculty who assembled at Howard and developed a program that over its first 10 years produced about 60% of the African-American PhDs in atmospheric sciences. And, and, you know, I was one of the folks who wrote the, um, plan for that program, lobby to get it implemented at Howard and ultimately got the, the program implemented. Um, and in, actually in addition to the black PhDs, uh, it generated 30% of the Latina PhDs in atmospheric sciences over that same period. And so one program, um, and successfully, um, while only two I think went into the academy, um, the rest of the folks uh, are working in atmospheric sciences, largely in the federal government and private sector. But um, we recognized even at that time that the academy was not a welcoming place. And so intentionally built relationships with the federal agencies, with private sector industries in atmospheric sciences, earth system sciences, climate sciences, to make sure that we had the type of partnerships that students could move through and into careers successfully. So they could follow their pursuits, they could follow their interests and move through. And so um, one of the, um, I guess that's not for me, one of the um, you know, things that I learned in doing this and taking actually what were probably large career risks um, was learning how to organize groups of folks around a common idea, develop strategic plans, implement those plans, and, and keep um, generating critical masses of um, diverse uh, talent from marginalized identities. Uh, and so we focused a lot on African-Americans, uh, Latinx uh, identities there. Um, and it was sort of like a snowball as, as you know, ran the NASA Center successfully, kicked off uh, the Atmospheric Sciences graduate program. It was going well. Uh, we started a nonprofit, Color of Weather, which sort of catalyzed um, sort of a hybrid mentoring model in atmospheric sciences, largely at uh, the American Meteorological Society, but that built momentum in these circles that helped us sort of continue 
uh, with a sort of a positive feedback to build the program, to build out relationships uh, and establish a reputation. And um, I will say um, NASA was a great partner, NOAA is a great partner in then providing access to other leadership opportunities within those agencies on advisory committees, um, seeing how other large programs worked. Um, and so we were able to, I was able to leverage some of those to write uh, for a large cooperative science center at NOAA, uh, the educational partnership program with minority serving institutions was a, a program that came online in 2001. We successfully uh, were awarded a um, cooperative science center there, which I served as director for about 18 years. But that um, program and its successor um, programs allowed us not only to support the, uh, the graduate program, but also graduate research and expand that graduate research into partnerships with a lot of uh, R1 historically white institutions and build partnerships out that way. Uh, and again, as we built the partnerships, there was opportunities to see how things are done in a lot of different places, bring back some of those, some of those promising practices to Howard and continue to support the development of a large research infrastructure. And so, you know, the, the leadership path, I think John said, there's a lot of fortune that goes along with it. And I, I think that's, I think it's, if I were to add to that, I think the persistence and, um, and not, performing the risk analysis at each stage in a way that I think it, it tends to overtake innovation and risk elsewhere. Um, so barriers were a lot, um, but they varied over the course of the career. Um, I'd say the barriers that I had in graduate school uh, as a postdoc working at Lawrence Livermore were very different from the barriers at Howard University. You know, barriers of isolation, um, were profound, uh, actually, uh, and I've published some on those, but, um, you know, you, it really does serve you well to have a strong sense of self. Um, I think not having, having a network of mentors, a uh, community, I think, uh, as, as Rita mentioned, um, of like-minded folks who, who value you as a person so that you don't feel you have to compromise yourself as you're, as you're doing your science and, and expanding out. Um, but the erasure, uh, certainly at an HBCU trying to do competitive research, um, when you come from a culture or a mindset that is collaborative in nature and that is looking to the generation behind you and say, how do I lift you up versus how do I build my specific career? And those appear as binaries a lot in the STEM community. It's easier to forget about the next generation and say, I'm just gonna do this science, publish my papers, and I'll worry about that a little bit later. And that's a clearer path than saying, I want to program build. I want to build these lattices or these um, structures that is gonna build a generation and a community that's gonna look different than the one that I had to navigate. Um, in my group of colleagues who went through geoscience programs in the 80s, you refer to it as a razor's edge. You slip, you're gonna get damaged. Pretty much you're gonna lose an arm or a leg or you die. So you can't make mistakes. And that's how you navigate the path. And that's not how most people navigate the path. That's not how the broader, um, unmarginalized, privileged portion of the uh, community navigates it. And I think that's, um, that's something that's a huge deterrent to students uh, coming in who have great capacity potential, but weighing what that looks like, like why would you put yourself through that? Um, there is significant expertise in salary devaluation, both certainly at HBCUs, but even beyond that. And I think that's a struggle and a deterrent. Um, you know, the personal taxes and limitations on, you know, 
I find that there is a lot of uh, generational wealth that uh, accompanies a lot of folks in the academy that is not part of a lot of students' experiences who come from uh, African-American and, and Latinx backgrounds who I've been affiliated with. And that's really a significant barrier, even for me as a single father in graduate school. How do you, you know, how do you go to conferences where you marshal the funds to, to do the things that everyone else is doing uh, at the time? Um, and then I think uh, the tokenism that accompanies being one of the first or one of the few. Um, the term that I've talked about with um, Ryan Emanuel, who's uh, North Carolina uh, State, the sort of the, uh, the unicornification of uh, minoritized individuals, especially in geosciences, is, is profound. Um, and it is also a deterrent because it's, you know, one person is successful, therefore anyone else's failure is individualized as their fault because this one person can do it. And if this one person did something exceptional, then everyone should be able to do it because they did it. And that means there must not be any barriers. And so that your success is weaponized in certain ways that you have to be aware of if you're going to try to bring other people along, especially along a path as fraught as uh, the paths that, that we were able to navigate. Um, and I think uh, that's something that does not get discussed in critical ways in mentoring a lot of times. Um, you know, and, and I think the mentoring model is also problematic. The single mentor mentoring model is, is, is outdated. I think there's more and more literature that's suggesting that that be different, um, but I think it's vital. And again, the first panel did a great job in covering a lot of ground. It's vital that the, whatever the, you call the mentoring, it needs to be critical enough to always place a value on the individual's person, your self-care, your worth, your innate worth that you bring into the field. Um, because I don't think that equity and justice is always, does it, it always has to be transactional, that it has to be, we do this because we benefit. Because if it's, if it's lensed only as being transactional, because it's, it's actually a moral imperative, just like, equality in society is a moral imperative. Um, if it's couched as being transactional, then if, if you don't receive greater benefits because you included more people, then you have a rationale for saying, okay, let's not include those people anymore because we didn't get the benefit we thought we were gonna get. And so I think it is incumbent upon leadership uh, moving forward um, in the academy in particular, that they be fully accountable for equity, for justice in STEM and the full representation that goes along with that. Um, you know, representation is, a, is an indicator of a greater um, quality of the community. And the goal should not be how many people we have in the room who look this way or that way or identify this way or that way, but does everyone you know, is it an equitable and just community so that everyone has the ability to be their true self in the space? And when you're trying to, you know, when you're trying to address the types of problems that we need to address, especially in geosciences, but really in, in science and society, that you're doing it in a fully equitable way. That you're recognizing the value of indigenous knowledge. You're recognizing the value of um, cultural knowledge across all the cultural richness that's in the United States. And you're doing it in a critical way where you recognize what the structural barriers are. So I don't wanna, I'll jump to uh, a little bit of the, um, other questions uh, and certainly yield time to my colleague, uh, Gilda, but where are we in terms of preparing and nurturing rising leaders? I think in terms of a comprehensive strategy, um, what came to mind is that we're in the great dismal swamp. And at first sound, that might 
And that sounds so great. And, and we're not in a great place. But the history of the Great Dismal Swamp is, is really complex and unique. It was a place where African-American uh, enslaved uh, escaped and built coalitions across uh, indigenous communities, uh, across uh, sort of proletariat working communities that were actually marginalized and developed uh, a knowledge base and skill and society that was turns out to be very valuable and translated a lot of things back into the main society. Um, but it was a harboring place. Um, it was sort of a um, temporary um, stage. And I hope that we are in a temporary stage that will lead to a much better place in terms of generating leadership that is equitable and just and inclusive. Um, we've got to be intentional about it though. And I don't believe that we are. Um, we're very intentional about focusing on barriers that happen early. I think that's good. You know, recruitment is very intentional, uh, well, is intentional in a lot of places. Um, but there's a number of people at various stages in the pipeline who if there was an intentionality at the mid-level of uh, bringing in cluster hires of folks back from industry, recruiting uh, people who decided not to go into academy but brought them in, you still have a huge amount of talent um, that exists right now that doesn't need to be erased or excluded or ignored at the expense of trying to generate a new fresh pool of students coming through. I think you can do that in, simul, you know, in parallel. I think that there can be some creative ways of recruiting into the academy in particular, um, leadership from industry, leadership from the federal government, um, more um, balanced partnerships with HBCU programs, which are producing these outsized um, numbers of students who go on to get PhDs, but also have more diverse faculty. And how do you uh, support and recruit and cultivate uh, diverse faculty if that's, if that's truly the challenge. Um, and so I think it's another part of the leadership generation is doing it, is moving from the, the current models that we have that current tend to dominate in the academy. Um, I think we've got to um, flatten the academy. I, I'm not convinced that we can make the changes that we need to make and preserve the hierarchical structures in the academy, the current dominant forms of promotion and tenure um, evaluation that we currently have. Um, because I think they devalue specifically uh, the types of contributions and um, knowledge ways and intellectual frameworks that a lot of uh, BIPOC students and scholars, emerging scholars and existing scholars bring to the fore that can actually enhance the scientific community. And so I think we have to be transformational uh, in the academy and that means policies have to change. Uh, and it means that power structures and decision-making structures have to change and be more inclusive. Um, because if you have, if you're only bringing in junior faculty, you're only bringing in graduate students, you're only bringing in undergraduate students, they're not making any decisions. Um, and they're, and if the, you're bringing them in on a transactional basis, okay, you're a diversity hire or you're a diversity, you know, scholarship or we're bringing you in because we need to get more diverse, but you're going to have to navigate this at a disadvantage you're kind of setting up people to fail unless they happen to be these unicorns that you then tokenize once they get through the system. And so this is just feeding the system in the same way that it's been operating for the last 50 to 70 sort of Jim Crow years. Um, is that a time signal for me? Yes.